Hi and welcome to episode number 29 of the Introvert Biz Growth Podcast, the show where I talk to introverts who grow their business and make a difference. I'm Sarah Zanacroce and I'm so happy that you're spending this time again with me. Today I'm going to talk to Joanna Penn, who is a New York Times and USA Today bestselling author. But I'm going to get to Joanna in a little bit, because first I want to tell you a little bit about this retreat that I just came back from. If you had listened to the latest episode, I was just about to leave on this retreat, marketing retreat in Tuscany. And at the same time, I announced my retreat in Sicily next year. Uh, but first, I want to tell you about the Tuscany retreat. So I had a, had a great time. It was a, an amazing week. I learned so much for my own business. I enjoyed helping uh, the other entrepreneurs with their businesses. Uh, it really was an amazing week. And if you might remember that I was kind of anxious because you know, I didn't know what to expect as an introvert spending a full week with uh, seven other people that you don't know is quite intimidating. But turned out that it was an amazing week and I did have enough time to kind of recharge my energy. Uh, every night at 9.30, I just kind of, yeah, told everybody, okay, that's enough talking for me. I'm just going to uh, sit quietly in my room and you know they they got used to that and they totally accepted it and of course it helped that the the organizer Lou Borton was also an introvert and there was one other lady um, Tassie Russo who uh, I invited to be on the show eventually uh, was also a fellow introvert so obviously there was a lot of an understanding from their side but even the extroverts in the group there were totally fine with it because you know they still had the energy to to keep talking so they didn't need me to to uh, participate that much so anyways it was a great week and what I realized is that I really do want to make this happen uh, I want to create my own retreat in Sicily next year and I want it to be a retreat that's especially geared towards introverts but I'm not at all opposed to also have ambiverts there. I don't know if you've, I've ever explained the term ambivert on the podcast, but it's basically people actually just like myself, because I can totally be an extrovert in some situations and I'm very, you know, social in certain circumstances. But in the end, where I do recharge my energy is by being by myself. And so um, that's that's an ambivert and I'm, I think I am an ambivert. And yeah, so anyways, it, maybe, you know, it won't only be introverts. It will be also um, people who are totally okay with uh, social settings. And I, I think it'll be an amazing event so I really am excited to plan for this because obviously it's a year from now so I have a lot of time to plan it but uh, you know as I always say pre-excitement is half the event so I really look forward to planning it I already planned out the activities we're gonna uh, go visit Noto which is a UNESCO World Heritage and Syracuse which is a beautiful beautiful city and there's also um, some other uh, events planned like uh, a cooking class and um, what else did I plan walks on the beach maybe a yoga session so lots and lots of good ideas now I just need to kind of put them all together uh, create the landing page because I don't have that yet but um, just wanted to give you a heads up and you know what gets me excited right now is really to to plan for that and uh, kind of share with you along the way because it's not just that I'm sharing this as you know publicity and in, in, in kind of promoting it but I'm also sharing with you the process of planning for the event uh, in case who knows you might want to organize your own um, so that's uh, why I'm doing this Anyways, back to the show. As I said, I'm going to be talking to Joanna Penn, who is a New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of thrillers under J.F. Penn. She also writes inspirational nonfiction for authors and is an award-winning creative entrepreneur and international professional speaker. 
Her site, thecreativepen.com, is regularly voted one of the top 10 sites for writers and self-publishers. Very excited to be talking to Joanna today. On to the show. Hey, Joanna, how are you today? I'm fine. Thanks for having me, Sarah. It's great to be here. Uh, yes, we just discussed offline how uh, it was quite challenging to get together as busy entrepreneurs as we are, but yeah. here we are. And I'm <laughs> super thrilled that uh, you could make the time. So Joanna, besides your official bio that I just read in the intro, tell us a little bit about yourself and maybe something that my introverted audience can relate to. Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, I write fiction and nonfiction and I have a website for authors and I live in Bath in England. And I guess, you know, in terms of uh, introverted authors, I'll share my secret weapon at the moment, which is I've just discovered noise cancelling headphones. Now, maybe a whole load of <laughs> listeners already use these. Um, I'm using the Bose ones. And oh my goodness, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm, a, I'm also a, a sound sensitive introvert. So mm. if someone's like eating nuts, or I can hear TV from across the, the road, you know, like I'm really sensitive to noise. So now I just put my noise cancelling headphones on and life is brilliant. So um, I do find that I do tend to spend a lot of time in my own head or listening to rain and thunderstorms, which possibly <laughs> says a lot about my British upbringing. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So yeah, noise cancelling headphones. I, I know my, my husband is a big fan of them. Me, myself, I don't know, they they kind of give me a headache sometimes because so, <laughs> it because it kind of blocks everything and so I feel like I can't breathe in my head but that's just me um so yeah tell us a little bit about your yourself being an author have you always been an author um how did you get into writing and then maybe how are you currently generating revenue because there's the books, but from your website, um, I could tell that there's also something more related to online entrepreneurship. So mm, that was a sure. lot of questions. So the first yeah. one was kind of like, how did you get into writing? Yeah, sure. So um, it's interesting seeing that you do LinkedIn because I think of LinkedIn in my former life. So I was a business consultant working with large corporates and I used to implement accounts payable systems, which is just super boring, um, but very highly paid. So I worked for companies like Accenture, Capgemini, IBM, and, you know, went into companies and did this not very creative work. But I ended up, you know, sort of mid thirties um, with the golden handcuffs, you know, being paid uh, enough, you know, a lot of money really to travel and do this work. But I was miserable. I just, mm. I was so miserable. I was so miserable. I used to cry at work. And it, it, when it got to that point, my husband was like, what are you doing? And I'm like, well, I can't give up my job because what about the house? What about the mortgage and all the other things that you're meant to do by the time you're mid 30, uh, mid thirties. And, you know, so I was like, okay, well, I've spent this, you know, 13 years uh, as a business consultant, what, what do I really want to do with my life? You know, is this it? Do I just uh, buy another house and build some investments? You know, it was, it was that mm -hmm. point. And so I started um, reading a lot of self-help books and I started writing my own book about how to find a career that you love. Um, I rewrote that a few years later. It's called Career Change. Um, but back then when I was 2006, I was writing that um, first book, and in the process of writing that book and, and um, then publishing it, I self-published it back before self-publishing was trendy. Uh, and then learning about book marketing and blogging and marketing and sales and all these different things, I realized that actually what I enjoyed was not necessarily the career change aspect. It was the writing and publishing aspect. So I kind of, I wrote that first nonfiction uh, 2006 to 2008 and then published 2008, started my website, thecreativepen.com, pen with a double M, and then started blogging and speaking. So um, professional speaking as well. Uh, and then as I kept going, 2010, 2011, I started writing fiction. Mm -hmm. And then sort of fast forwarding 2011, I left my day job. So I was making enough money by then with this, the side hustle, as they call it these days, that I could leave my job. And then 2015, my husband left his job 
job. So now there's two of us in the oh, business. Oh, wow. Yeah, That's it's awesome. really good. Yeah, That's I hired funny. him out of his job. So he used to work <laughs> at uh, Deloitte. And then I said, look, you know, why are you going and working for someone else? Come and work for our business. So our business right now is we make um, money from book royalties, obviously, and we do ebook, print book, um, and audio books. We've sold books in 83 countries, so fiction and non-fiction. Uh, so that's sort of the book sales side. Then I have affiliate sales and I sell other people's courses and products. Um, things like the headphones I mentioned, you know, I would write a blog post about that and have an Amazon affiliate link to, to that and make a percentage of, of the commission, uh, which is a very common internet um, way of earning money, as, as you know. Then I make money from selling my own courses. So I have a course on how to write a novel and another course called Creative Freedom, which is how to make a living with your writing. And then I also have sponsorship, uh, which is things like Patreon and uh, people who pay to advertise on my podcast. And then finally, I have speaking. And speaking is only about 4% of my income. So 96% of my income is online and scalable and, uh, you know, pretty much location independent, which was always my desire back in 2006 when I went, what do I really want to do? It was travel, write, and, you know, generally live the life I wanted to. Wow. <laughs> That's all I can say right now. And, and the second thing is, wait till my husband hears what you just said about your Oh, yeah. Husband. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's amazing. Okay, let's, let's back up a little bit because you mentioned all these different online, you know, generating revenue uh, streams. So, so the first one was obviously your book sales. And then it's um, courses and, and I guess ebooks from your website where you sell directly from your website, correct? Uh, I count those as book sales. So okay. I count those as selling direct, um, any kind of book sale I put in, in book royalties. Okay. And then you have the affiliate marketing where you promote other people's stuff. Mm -hmm. You have a course as well. Is that a, a video course? Yeah, a couple, a couple of courses, multimedia courses, um, you know, through Teachable. I don't know if you know Teachable, but it's, mm -hmm. you know, it used to be a few years ago that if you wanted to build a course, and in fact, I did have courses a few years back where I hosted them on my own custom sites and it was just a technical nightmare and now there's things like teachable.com and other platforms where we can create courses much more easily um, and still make the revenue but you know use the software as a service so yeah yeah teachable is a great one i think there's another one called thinkafig so that that would be another one that um, i make sure i post the links in the show notes for those oh yeah and then there was the speaking correct Yes, uh, speaking as I said, it's very small, like four percent. Um, I do have the sponsorship, so sponsorship is actually now five percent of my income, which is um, Patreon on the podcast, which has been such a surprise for me, uh, because if people don't know Patreon, you know, people, my podcast is free; it goes out every Monday, and we're on episode like three hundred and twenty or something, and people can get it for free, but some people choose to pay, so it's really quite exciting to be, you know, have this um, extra revenue stream from people people who just want to um, sort of give money to keep the podcast going. So that's yeah, actually that's bigger amazing. than mine. Yeah. And it's bigger than my professional speaking now. So I'm like, yeah, I mean, we'll come to in a minute, you know, the things I, I like less are groups of people. So <laughs> I'm quite happy for that to be smaller. <laughs> I'm sure it's an introvert's dream. You don't have to <laughs> speak that many times anymore and you just, yeah, uh, create and, and, and because yeah, you still need to create a lot of content. So do you still have, time to write books or is it mainly managing you know your business now and and, and blogging of course and, and creating content for the podcasts uh no i i pretty much spend most of my time creating books um so every day i spend you know between two and five hours on whatever book I'm working on or whatever product. So sometimes that product might be a course, but my focus is really on creating intellectual property assets mm -hmm. that keep making money for the long term. So a book is this kind of magical thing that can um, make money in so many different ways. So in terms of the blog, I the podcast, I obviously, I batch my podcasts like many people. So I'll do, I'll try and do a whole load of interviews in a over a couple of days and then schedule those for the next, you know, six weeks or 
something. So that batches those together. And then I have a virtual assistant who does all the show notes and also manages the guest posting on the blog uh, and that type of thing. So in the last year or so, I've really tried to switch my creative mode from things like blogging to creating those intellectual property assets. And the big thing, I think you'll, you'll hear this from many online entrepreneurs, you know, to grow from six figures to multi six figures, you really have to start uh, using other people <laughs> to do the work. Mm-hmm. Um, so outsourcing the things that, you know, for example, doing a transcript of my podcast is not something I'm going to spend my time on. And then even editing that transcript you know, is not a great use of my time. So I pay a virtual assistant to do things like editing my show notes and transcript while I spend my time creating um, new books and products. Yeah, you really need to, um, you know, save your time for creative outcomes and and, and Mm. yeah, kind of creating new products that will then sell in the future. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Wonderful. So let's talk about your introverted superpowers, like I like to call them. What do you think is your biggest strength as an introverted entrepreneur, especially as an author? And um, yeah, for what you do, what's your biggest strength? Yeah, I think I think it's probably that I really like being on my own. <laughs> And I I just, you know, apparently some writers are extroverts, but I don't know how you could do it as a long-term career if you didn't enjoy hours and hours every day of your own company in your own head, thinking and writing and editing and all the things that you do. I mean, it's, the, the hours I spend, and I, I go to a local cafe now wearing my um, my sound cancelling headphones. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, at the moment I'm focusing on a nonfiction book, but I just finished a, a novel, um, actually co-written with one of your other guests, Jay Thorne, who was on your podcast oh, uh, a while great. back. Yeah, Jay and I co-wrote. Um, actually, it was quite funny, four introverts on a train and then in New Orleans for a week co-writing a book. It was, it was amazing that we actually spoke to each other, but we managed it. <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah i think i think my biggest strength is the ability to focus and go deep and be on my own and and work on these individual projects and you know get stuff out there so i think if you don't have that focus and that ability to be alone you will struggle being a writer that's true what what i also have seen though in the in the last few months is that you know it's probably not the same business model like you have, but people who write a book and it has to be this big giant book launch because that's how they want it. You know, they want to become the New York times bestseller or something like that. And then a book launch for an introvert, in my opinion, just needs a lot and a lot of energy. So that's when the introvert has to almost become an extrovert because he has to be out there all the time, you know, doing book tours Mm. and launches and interviews and all of that. How do you launch a new book? Is it like a big book launch tour as well or how do you Uh, promote it? That's, um, yeah, I mean, that model you're talking about is very much traditional publishing Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm an independent author. So I run my own publishing house. Um, So because (laughs) uh, the the little known secret is that uh, if you, take a publishing deal you're paying between 70 to 90 percent of your profit to the publishing house right. um i prefer to keep yes. um that money <laughs> so i i as my own you know running my own publishing house as an independent author that's how i do it so i don't do book tours as such to me they don't actually sell books i focus a lot on online marketing right. so for me a book launch is often you know if you have a book on pre-order and you have scheduled a whole load of online marketing email list blasts and or ads and things like that the actual launch is not a big deal I mean I've got a lot of books now so uh, a book launch is not is not a huge deal Mm -hmm. but I would say on the on the doing extroverted things um, I'm not a shy introvert I think that um, some people are but I'm not and a friend of mine was saying well you have to think of extrovert as like a verb. So you have to go an extrovert. So <laughs> like if you're going to go on TV like or that. something. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. So if you're going to go on TV or you're going to do a book launch, or if you're going to do anything where you need that sustained energy, you, you have to extrovert yourself and just kind of fake it and treat it as, as the job that it is for a while. And then, um, you know, go back to just being you. Um, so I think, I think that 
introverts do have to do this type of stuff and that's fine but you can engineer things like book launches product launches to be focused online where we have the advantage you know it really is an advantage to be able to do things online within different time zones and all these different things that we do by marketing online and creating online great okay let's talk about challenges or weaknesses but I like challenge better so (laughs) what do you think is challenging for you as an introverted online entrepreneur well, you know, you say that and I, uh, Tim Ferriss, I'm sure you know mm-hmm. Tim Ferriss, lots of people know Tim Ferriss. And I think he actually says, you know, embrace your strengths and then just disregard your weaknesses. Like, you know, if, if they are a weakness, just forget about it. Don't spend time working on your weakness, just focus on your strength, which I like. So I think my probably, I was thinking about this, one of my biggest weaknesses would be not liking phone calls. Oh, <laughs> like yeah. I, will, I will do anything. To, and this is different because we scheduled a podcast and when there are questions, like you sent me questions and I thought about it so it's not like a phone call but I literally will not answer my phone (laughs) I'll never answer my phone to just you know randomly and that's why I don't like things like PR Um, I know you had Janet Murray on the show which is hilarious because I had her on my podcast talking about PR and afterwards I said to her Janet you know I don't think I'm ever going to do anything you said because (laughs) I don't want to follow up with anyone I don't want to phone anyone I don't want to be on the phone And so I I think that is a weakness because sometimes a phone call can really help, but I'll find myself like someone will say, oh, can I just talk to you about this? Uh, just get on the phone for, for 10 minutes and I'll say, uh, no, I'm working in the library. <laughs> and so I can't get on the phone because I'm probably lying about that. <laughs> That's funny. I, I think it was Ian Brody, who's also in the UK. I don't know if you know about him. No. He's into email marketing and he said this, the exact same thing about not liking phone calls. And, and I don't know if it's every introvert, but yeah, I'm definitely not liking phone calls either and I just always (laughs) prefer emails you know it's like because I can think about what I want to say Mm. like it might take me a half hour to write the perfect email but at least it didn't have to yeah confront the person uh, over the phone so totally yeah and maybe it's yeah like you said maybe it's just the ability to think about it beforehand which makes podcasting much easier because as the host you research the person and as the interviewee you've got the question and in fact I get really upset if people don't send me questions beforehand Mm. like you know I'll be emailing the person going ah where are the questions (laughs) yeah (laughs) let me prepare yeah Yeah, exactly so I think I do think that is a kind of introverted thing yeah yeah we're, we're we're less spontaneous maybe than, than extroverts hmm. um let's go to an aha moment where you know something happened and then you just realized something can be either about writing or about your introversion anything something come to mind Yeah. So I was thinking that it was probably the biggest thing that made a difference to my life now is that back in 2008, the global financial crisis, Mm -hmm. I'm sure people remember that. (laughs) Um, I was one of the many people laid off during that you know, time, those first few months in 2008 was kind of completely crazy. And um, my manager came in the room and I was working in one of those big open plan floors with hundreds of you know, computer workers, um, horrible thing that I think about now. Um, but he basically came around and gave everyone a a piece of paper and everyone was laid off in one day and we were given a couple of weeks money and, and that was it. Now I got another job within a couple of weeks, but at that moment I thought, you know, I just lost all my income in one Mm -hmm. day. Mm -hmm. One company, one person somewhere in a chain said, right, you know, get rid of that, you know, cost center. And that was me. And so I just decided that day to never let one company control all my income. And so that's really shaped the way I run my business. So, you know, I don't rely on one product. I have multiple books. I have, I have around a hundred different streams of income at this point. <laughs> oh my God. Wow. <laughs> well, so, I mean, I, some are like $5 a month, you know, but some still are, it adds up. Right? It does. And yeah. some are thousands of dollars a month. I have multiple books. 
So if you're an author, never rely on one book. It will only ever be either a small trickle or a spike and then it will disappear. Um, I sell in, as I said, I've sold books in 83 countries. I, I work on global marketing. I don't do anything locally. I'm, I'm not at all interested in selling in a bookstore in Bath. What I want is to be in, in every country in the world. Um, I make money in multiple currencies and uh, you and I being in Europe, we understand how the European political situation right now is affecting the currencies and to make money in US dollars as well as GBP as well as Australian dollars, for example, and I'm trying to grow my income in the, in the Far East, it, you know, will help hedge those things over time. So it's, it's like an obsession of mine to make sure that when, or fiction and nonfiction, having both fiction and nonfiction means that as things go up and down with the market, I've always got something cushioning me. So um, that's probably the biggest aha moment that day. And I still remember it, you know, being handed a piece of paper that basically said, that's your money cut off. And, and I will not let that happen again. Yeah. I think, I don't know if I should bring this up here, but, but it's just that something happened yesterday. Um, this guy who was supposed to put our armoire together again that we had taken apart because we had some work done in the house. I called him and I said, look, we can put this back together. And, and he told me, I just had an accident. I cannot work. Mm -hmm. I have to be in a wheelchair for at least four years and, and all of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why am I bringing this up, Joanna? Just because this is, you know, great in terms of, you know, kind of, yeah, spreading your different income streams. I think what we need to remember here also as entrepreneurs is to take care of ourselves because we are in the end, our biggest assets, right? And yeah. So this is very important to me to kind of make sure that we also take care of our own health, right? Because if we do all of this, this is great, but what if something happens to us or what if we work so much that we, you know, because we're all our own biggest assets, would you agree? Uh, to a point, but the point of running an intellectual property asset business is that each of my books um, become a profit center as such, because I totally agree with you. And up until, like I said, about two years ago, everything was dependent on me. Mm -hmm. And if I got hit by a bus, it was all going going wrong. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then, um, and then I basically started thinking about, okay, so how do we make it that if something happens to me, which it will at some point, let's face it, um, uh, you know, none of us, uh, none of us are going to live forever. You know, how will this business carry on and how mm -hmm. will it benefit my family? So this, I mean, it's depends yeah. where the, it depends on where the listeners are in their journey into entrepreneurship, because when you're just starting out, like if you're making 10 bucks a month, then that's brilliant, you know, on the side, then fantastic fantastic and then it's a hundred and then it's a thousand and then it's ten thousand and then it, and then you give up your job or whatever and then you start thinking okay well how do I run this all myself and mm -hmm. then you start outsourcing and then at the point where I am it's how can I make this come like I I want to appoint a CEO at some point so I can just get back to writing right. exactly. <laughs> so but yeah. I totally agree with you and yeah. and some of this but but let me just coming back to intellectual property I just want people to really think about that because the problem with like having a content-based business just based on affiliate affiliate income for example that will go away the moment something changes like the algorithms or you know you you have an accident or whatever but books and intellectual property assets will keep paying you money a bit like mm. investing money in various you know bonds and stocks and that type of thing right. so I just want people to think in, in a much bigger way about what those income streams can be they don't have to be all you and that's they the kind of scalable thing mm -hmm. yeah that's a scale yeah. or, or books you create once but they're scalable they they can sell for the rest of your life and 70 years after you die yeah. so that's massive mm, yeah well I'm glad we brought that up and I'm glad we kind of you know went full circle and said okay this is all the things you can do and you're already doing them that's amazing and still it's important to you know first of all take care of yourself and also make sure that you add income streams that are not you know, directly related to you and, and that keep, keep coming in. So wonderful. Let's uh, shift gears a little bit and talk about some tools, online tools and resources that you're using in your business uh, or that your virtual assistants are using maybe. First of all, let's start with a personal habit. What, what do you do on a regular basis except 
writing, of course, that something that you do continuously that contributes to your success? I think the main thing is managing a schedule on a daily basis. And my time, I book my time out six you know, six to 12 months in advance in terms of the big blocks of time. So speaking is a good example. Um, uh, You know, I get asked to speak a lot, but because it's so exhausting for me, I say no to a lot of it and yes to things that either help me travel um, or (laughs) that I really want to be part of. So I use Google Calendar and I will schedule those things in and then I will schedule my writing time, which is a daily recurring writing slot. Then I'll schedule things like this always in the afternoon. I'll schedule time out because I'm really bad at um, falling apart after events. So Mm -hmm. tomorrow, for example, as we speak, no, not tomorrow, Saturday, um, which is in two days after we speak, I'm doing an event and I've put Sunday and Monday, I've, my diary says recovery time. Nice. So Mm -hmm. that I don't book um, podcast interviews or anything else on those days because I know how tired I'm going to be. Even though every time I go, oh, it will be fine. I know that I need that. So using a calendar to schedule things like recurring writing time and recovery time, those are the things that can help you. And to make sure that you've scheduled uh, holidays and breaks, like you said about looking after yourself, Mm -hmm. um, these are things that are really important uh, to do. Yeah, especially the recovery time after events. I, I learned that the hard way where I thought, well, you know, it's just it's at night, so I can do a training the next day. No, I oh. can't. It's just, no. <laughs> yeah. uh, my whole week is going to be unproductive if I do that. Because mm-hmm. I'll be so tired that the next day, then I won't be able to do anything. So it's just good to yeah reserve that time for recovery. Wonderful. What about an internet resource that you uh, use continuously? Yeah, so I want to share too because um, mm-hmm. if people are writing books, this, these will really help. So Scrivener for writing. Um, do you know Scrivener? I know it uh, by You've my husband. Yeah, yeah, because he's uh, he does that aspiring yeah. writer. Yes. Oh, great. Well, Scrivener. <laughs> if people haven't used Scrivener, if, if you're writing fiction or nonfiction, Scrivener is amazing um, writing software. Just really revolutionised how I write books. Um, helps you organise so much better than using you know Word or anything like that. So that's for writing and then um, vellum for ebook formatting. So, you know, getting into how to self publish is a big, is another question. But yeah. in, if, if you're formatting your own ebooks for the Kindle or iBooks or whatever, um, vellum is incredible. It actually makes ebook formatting really fun. So that's V E L L U M. Um, it's only for the Mac, but people who are PC users have started to use it within Mac in cloud, which is like cloud based Mac software. Yeah, because Vellum, I mean, it used to be that, um, you know, you'd have to pay people to format your eBooks, but Vellum makes it so easy. And it means you can update your Kindle files all the time. So if you write a new book, you can, you know, change the back matter and upload it. Or if someone finds a typo, you just change it and upload it. And oh, it's just amazing. Um, Completely revolutionary for eBook formatting. So that's Scrivener and Vellum. That's really helpful. I, I remember um, probably about four years ago when I uh, published my first ebook on on Kindle. It was a nightmare, exactly. It was <laughs> like so. This sounds uh, very helpful. Wonderful. What about a book uh, that you would recommend to the introvert biz growth audience, and why? Yeah, so I, I read so many books. Like I'm sure everybody listening. Do introverts read more? I mean, I, I yes, don't know, but um, I think so. Yeah, <laughs> certainly. So I was trying to think, and then again, it will depend on where you are in your journey of being an entrepreneur. But um, I went with the Success Principles by Jack Canfield that had a 10 year anniversary last year because that's the book I read back in 2006 that changed my life because it's about how to get from where you are to where you want to be. And And um, the very first one is take 100% responsibility for your life. So I, you know, I was uh, at that point, I was working in this very good day job, making very good money, but I was miserable. And I had that realization that all the little decisions I had made got me to that point. I had said yes to things that I shouldn't have said yes to. I took the money over the passion. I, you know, there were lots of, I thought I'd just fallen into this, but 13 years later, you can't really say that you've fallen into it. You know what I mean? So reading that book and taking responsibility for my life, you know, now I can look back at the last 10 years. So since 2006, you know, 2007, 
the little decisions I've made and the choices I've made have led to this point, which is where I'm really happy with my life and my business. And I'm, I'm being creative and making much more money than I made back then. So yeah, that's the success principles by Jack Canfield. Wonderful. I make sure to add that into the show notes. And then of course, we'll, we probably won't be able to link to all your books, but <laughs> probably to your author page on Amazon. Is, is that the best yeah, I think page um, to link to or to your own site. Uh, yes, I have a, a book page at thecreativepen.com forward slash books. But I would okay. I just recommend to people, uh, if you want to check out one of my books, probably The Successful Author Mindset um, by Joanna Penn is the one I'd recommend because that uh, comes from 10 years of sort of self-doubt and comparisonitis and uh, fear of failure and all the things that we feel as writers and as entrepreneurs. That book it, you know, means a lot to me and has, has helped a lot of people. So hopefully it will help some people listening as well. Great. Okay. We'll link to that one and then just to the general book page. Wow. You've shared a lot of um, wisdom here and, you know, your journey. It's so interesting. And, and I'm sure a lot of, I know that a lot of, and you know too, because otherwise your business wouldn't be thriving as much as it does, but a lot of people want to write books, right? Mm. So this will be a very interesting episode, I think, for my audience. I always end the, the conversation with a mindful ending. So the question would be, what are you grateful for today or this week or this month, Joanna? Well, it's funny because, um, I mean, I'm obviously grateful for where we are in terms of, um, you know, the internet world we live in. I'm super grateful for the internet every day and I write it down and I feel like an idiot because <laughs> but it's such a big deal. But today specifically, um, just coming back to the political turbulence, we actually had some elections in our area and I went and voted today. And I'm always grateful when I vote because, you know, as a woman living in the West, you know, I can vote um, in an election in a country where no one is well it's unlikely that anyone's going to bomb my city <laughs> so i just i feel very grateful today you know to be living in in england which is just a, a brilliant country switzerland's pretty good too i know <laughs> <laughs> but i do i do think it's so important you know i'm grateful for so much but to be just grateful about where we live sometimes yeah. feels feels right even if it's rainy because it's rainy today i love rain <laughs> you love rain okay <laughs> i'll send you mine i listen to rain on a on a sunny day so i just <laughs> I'm just like that. <laughs> I wonder if all the British are like that because otherwise how would they deal with it? <laughs> well, it's been a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for taking the time and sharing your story and, and sharing your wisdom with my audience. I'm very grateful for that. No worries. Thanks for having me, Sarah. Thanks, Joanna. Make sure you check out Joanna's website at thecreativepen.com and her Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash thecreativepen. That's it for this episode of the Introvert Biz Growth Podcast. You'll find this episode's show notes at sarasandacroche.com forward slash episode 29. And if you don't have it yet, get your free four-step guide on how to say no to grow. And I'll talk to you again in two weeks. I know it seems long, but time flies and pre-excitement is half the experience. Talk to you soon.